Hi, I'm in Los Angeles, California, to sit down and have a chat with Jeff Gundlach of Double Line. Jeff needs no introduction. He's always got something to say, and he's one of the most cerebral money managers out there today. I'm going to talk to him about politics, the dollar, the bond market, the equity market. There's so much ground I want to cover, and we've got a limited amount of his time, so let's dive straight into it. Jeff, thanks very much. Great to see you again. Good to see you, Grant. Um, thanks for doing this. I know you've not been well, and neither of us have been, so we'll yeah, try time, and get It's the time of year. It's that time of year here in a very cold Los Angeles. There's so much I want to talk to you about, but I want to start with the stock market. And there's something that's been on my mind, and that is December. Did, did something change in December, or was it just a glitch as it's been nailed? Well, I, I think that uh, the attitude about Jay Powell really changed a lot during December. It really yeah. kind of changed twice. First, it changed in a way that accelerated the stock market lower. And I think that also has something to do with year end. I think there was mm -hmm. people adjust things at year end. There may be some selling and the like. But Powell was thought to be different than the other Fed shares. I, I fell for it too. Yeah, he was supposed to be non-academic. He doesn't have a PhD in economics. And I think the word was pragmatic yeah. for Jay Powell. And then he showed up at the, after the rate hike at the press conference, and he sounded very different than being pragmatic. He basically said, we're on autopilot with quantitative tightening, which is the last thing that a falling stock market needs to hear because quantitative easing seems to be correlated with, with higher prices of quantitative yeah. tightening. It is interesting that the global stock market really accelerated to the downside in October, mm -hmm. which was when QT was ramped up to a maximum of 50 billion per month. So Powell says we're on autopilot, which the market was shocked to hear because they thought he was pragmatic and wouldn't be rigid in his thinking. And then he also used the word models a lot, yeah. inputs to the models. And all of a sudden, he sounded as wonky as any Fed chair ever gets and kind of detached from being pragmatic. And the market didn't like that at all. So it went accelerated. I think it went, dropped 800 points yeah. from when he opened his mouth to the end of the press conference. And that scared him. And we had a complete 180 from the pragmatic Powell to the Powell put, which wasn't supposed to exist at all. No. And I don't think I can remember rhetorical shift so rapid and so major from a Fed chair because just a few days later with the stock market in free fall, it's all about patience. And I didn't really ever say really that we were <laughs> yes. closed-minded on quantitative tightening and we trotted out many Fed officials to go along with this. And then there was that fateful afternoon where he was on stage with Bernanke and, and Janet Yellen. Yellen. Yep. And suddenly, it was one big dove fest, and a love fest, probably. Ever since then, it's like Powell put, and Fed's got your back. And also, year-end kicked in, where I think there was a lot of rebalancing. And I think it started maybe just before year-end. So we put in the low intraday on December 26th. Mm -hmm. The low close was the 24th. And I think the rebalancing was pretty major, because the stock market suddenly was negative, some significance for the year. And the bond market eked out a positive return that leads rebalancers to sell bonds and buy stocks. And that kind of started happening. So I think that fundamentally, I think we're in a bear market. Global equities peaked way back on January 26th of yeah. 2018. Right in the center of the coordinated global growth narrative, which was pretty well supported it by the data. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. true. But it's all based upon stimulus and, and the like. And so you had a classic kind of rolling top formation. Um, bear markets usually start, are preceded by something insane happening. And the insane thing goes on far longer right. than people believe that it should or could. So in the 1990s, it was dot coms, you know, where these IPOs were floated with no sales, let alone yeah. net revenue, and succeeded at IPO. And then in 07, it was the insane lending standards and leverage in the structured finance market, which went on for about two years longer than it seemed like it should have yeah. or could have. And this time it was cryptocurrency. So in 2018, or 2017 rather, you had this parabolic rise in Bitcoin, we'll just use it as a placeholder, where suddenly it was a mania. And that was observed because of Long Island iced tea, Yep. Changed its name to Long yeah. Island Blockchain. Kodak, which had a $100 million market cap. It's probably n nothing really there. They said they were going to do Kodak Coin, as if they could do that with a $100 million right. market cap. And 
the stocks went up 400% on these announcements, which was very reminiscent of the mentality of the dot-coms. Then Bitcoin started crashing about a month before the global stock market went to its peak. So that was the front edge mm -hmm. of the beginning of, of, I think, a risk bear market. And then global stocks, January 26th, and then utilities, and then transports, and then the Dow, and then the S&P, yeah. and finally the NASDAQ went to a new high into the early part of the fall. And then it was down to the fangs, and then it was down to Amazon and Apple, and then Amazon gave it up, and then Ab Apple announced, we don't really want to tell you how many phones we sell, right. because it sounds to me like it's not good news. Right. Or otherwise, they'd probably be fairly comfortable of reporting it. So down we went, and we had what people call a bear market, 20%, not on a close in the S&P, but intraday, and every other index did the 20%. But 20% is obviously an arbitrary number. It's more of a mentality. Yeah. It's more of a f change in preferences and the way people think about things. So we've had this uh, spectacular multi-week retracement, but I'm... Just don't think things are fundamentally healthy. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what it feels like. Because I, I, looking at those markets in, in sort of October, November, and then into the depths of December, the numbers were bad at the headline stage, but once you looked under at the plumbing, it looked really as though yeah. things got shaken quite severely. And yet yeah. we've seen this V bounce. Yeah. And I've been interested because people who've been around for a long, long time, who were very worried in October, November, December, seem very sanguine again now, which I find curious. Because it, I mean, is that all because they suddenly believe that the Fed has turned around and they are going to slow down. I think QT. you have to point to the Fed because the economic data continues to right. deteriorate. And we're starting to see reversals and unemployment claims now rising on a four-week moving average basis. We're starting to see earnings estimates collapsing, yeah. margin estimates collapsing, sales dropping. You see uh, housing is negative, surprise well, indices, confidence, indicators confidence all, all is deteriorating. None of these things are at the alarm bell recession, but they're getting fairly close. I mean, we were miles away from yeah. anything resembling a caution signal on the economy back in September. But there's been pretty much across the board deterioration in the economic surprise data and just data changes and the like. High yield spreads have come in a lot from their wides of December, but there's they still have a look that it's not, doesn't really all that long-term sanguine. And I think what people will increasingly understand is just how out of kilter our debt situation is yep. at the federal level, and forget about state and local, which is another problem, but just focusing on federal. I mean, in 2018, for the calendar year, not the fiscal, which is in September, but for the calendar year, the data was just announced recently, the national debt increased by $1.48 trillion. Now, that's about 7% of GDP. And this is when we're supposedly in a good economy mm -hmm. with 3% real GDP, 5.3 nominal through September. We don't have the data through year end yet. And you have to ask yourself, are we really growing at all in an organic way? Because the most recent data point on GDP, 5.3, is less than 7% of GDP, right? Yeah. Less than the growth in the debt. So if we hadn't grown the debt, by 7% of GDP, I guess we'd have a negative economy right now. And so what happens, one has to ask, during the next recession, which maybe is coming, again, no alarm bells blaring right now, but when it comes, just how big is the deficit going to be? Foreigners are not buying our debt anymore. The Fed, for now, is not buying our debt. They may, may change their mind again. I mean, again, one of the most amazing reversals, autopilot QT to last week, an admission that they're discussing using QE as a regular tool, yeah. not just emergency, even when you're not at zero interest rates. You don't just use it as part of your ordinary toolkit. So what happens when the next recession comes? Will the deficit be $4 trillion, $3 trillion? I, I don't know. But usually the debt-to-GDP ratio goes up by 4%. The deficit, sorry, deficit-to-GDP ratio goes up by 4% from uh, the, the good times to the recession. Does that mean we're going to go to 11%? Maybe worse than that. 